I have to say that I was a big fan as a little kid. My dad took me into Nick's Hot Dog Shop in Bethlehem on a Saturday because I went along with him in the washer repair business. The younger brother stayed home. He didn't want us fighting. But when we got into the place, Nick, Greek guy, loved wrestling. It would be on on the top of the, t the TV on top of the uh, soda cooler. Always get Ma's orange juice, ketchup and onions on the hamburgers. And I was mesmerized by these larger than life action figures before there were action figures. And I remember even seeing the Wolfman with the X. It looks like mass tape across the screen. And that stuck with me. Again, I remember the Flyers, Philadelphia Flyers, and their run and the Steelers in the late 70s. But sports didn't really do it for me. I don't call it sport. The sport of professional wrestling, I got the biggest kick out of. And uh, we never went. My dad was older than my mother. By 14 years, she came off the boat from Germany. We never went bowling, never went to the movies. But by gum, my dad took us, probably around junior high age, to the agricultural hall in the Allentown Fairgrounds where the WWWF TV tapings were. And I'll never forget walking in there because it was summertime for the first time. This would have been seventh grade, sixth, seventh grade. You, they can pinpoint the time because then they'll know when the angle was with Sweet Hanson. We walked in and one of the early matches is on because you'd pay $3 to see three hours, sometimes four in the winter months, of professional wrestling. I walked in and I kind of was suspect. I mean, these big, larger than life actors, but come on, they could be killing themselves, but they're not. At one point, my dad got fed up with the cigarette smoke in there, how these athletes worked, because it was a fog of smoke there. And then at some point, he would drop me and my younger brother off, and then he'd come back and pick us up because he didn't want to deal with the smoke. So then we'd tell him, oh, we're a little later, call on a payphone, dime then. And he'd just, oh, we're, we're still, his matches are still going on. But we'd hang around in the back, watch Tony Gurria, Larry Zabisco, and all the wrestlers and stuff backstage as you go around the back and such. Well... As we're doing this, we're, we're really, it got to the point where I kind of grew into it. So 7th, 8th grade, now I'm starting to work out with weights. And in wintertime, you could actually, because some people didn't show up for their uh, more expensive ringside seats. So I would come down once they were not going to show up, and I'd go down and sit in the second, third row. And of course, you're opposite camera. And I couldn't wait till Saturday, because every Tuesday uh, was um, bag haul. And then the other one was in Hamburg on a Wednesday. And I'd sit there, I'd look for myself and see what kind of tight shirt, uh, uh, tight shirts I had on to showcase my arms looking at this stuff. And I'll never forget the story. There's two things, because I was there for the first Piper's Pit with Jimmy Snuka. And I was also there when, of all things, uh, um, Larry Zabisco turned on Bruno. Oh, we went up after that. There was, you, that wasn't fake blood. It was coagulating on the camera. There was a lot of blood there. We, 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 we get there and we go, now Brad, we, no offense to your gym, but we, we need a real gym. Well, he's in Hamill, Minnesota, a suburb of Minneapolis. He goes, well, there's actually a gym down the street. It's ranked the number one gym in the country by the AAU. It's called The Gym. He goes, and two of the four owners are expecting you. We're like, what? He goes, well, it's a Jim Younger, another silent partner, but the Road Warriors are two of the four owners from this gym. We thinking on t we're thinking on TV they're from Chicago. It turns out they're from Minneapolis. Joe Laurinaitis, Road War Animal, actually is from Philadelphia. His dad got transferred when he was age 12. That's the older brother, John Laurinaitis. So when we get there, he said, yeah, I showed them pictures of you guys. They want to meet you. This is with when we first got there, the Road Warriors. So we're at the gym, their gym, and we're working out. A big food display, big thing upstairs, big thing. And a separate gym area where, where the chalk and powder was, you couldn't go in the place in that area of the gym unless you meet certain criteria. Mr. This, Mr. That, 500 pound bench press or whatever. Didn't want the chalk and powder all over the gym. Well, we get back because Rengens was in Japan and um, he happened to buy a video camera. So we actually saw it backstage of Road Warrior Hawk taking a backdrop and breaking his leg. He comes back early. We look up. Now remember, they told us they knew who we were. They knew what we looked like. They saw pictures. We never knew they're from Minneapolis. We, we look up at him. He's got the bandana on. No face paint, obviously. I look up. He smiles. I give him a thumbs up. He comes down, talks to us. He goes, hey, 
Did you guys sign with Vern Gagne? No, well, don't. He's an asshole. And Barry Darcel said, I, Brad said, you guys have a lot of talent. He goes, you should really go somewhere like Don Owen in Portland or Stu Hart in Calgary. Learn to work before you go on to one of these national promotions. He says, because they could eat you up there. And I looked at Brad and he nodded affirmatively. That's the only time that he gave an opinion, so to speak. Well, we tucked it away, but in our minds, look, we're already halfway across the country from Allentown. You got inarguably, or arguably, the top tag team of the time, the Road Wars, wanting us to come to Charlotte, an eight-hour road trip, and you want us to go twice as far across the country to Portland, Oregon, or Calgary, Alberta, and Canada, not even in this country. Well, it was an obvious decision. We go to Charlotte. And I'd be sitting there talking to Stu Hart. Now here it gets a little interesting, and he would, I would listen to him telling me, he goes, hey, you know, uh, hey, when you get out there, you're supposed to listen to the heel. He says, but you like to eat, don't you? Yeah, I like to eat. And he goes, uh, well, you know, you, you get to the buffet and you start picking around at the salad. He goes, some other glutton will get there and all the shrimp and the prime rib will be gone. He says, when you get out there, get to the shrimp and the prime rib. Don't wait. And the point is, don't wait for the heel to, the heel to tell you something. Just go out and grab what you want to eat. No, I, uh, I think we should have you, uh, this is my Bruce Hart, you know, when people sound lower voice to be more important than they are based on their stature. Uh, yeah, well, I was thinking more so that, uh, we'll have you, uh, no, no, we'll have you come from, uh, Steel Town, Pittsburgh. I said, I'm from Bethlehem. I was born in Bethlehem. That's a steel town. Yeah, nobody knows Bethlehem, uh, Pittsburgh, and, you know, Bronski, Brick Bronski. So when he says in his book that, he goes, or the interview, I go, he goes by the name Brick Bronsky. No, you gave me the damn name. So I'm sitting there, and I'm listening to this, and he goes, oh, Pittsburgh Bronsky. And I knew, ah, can you say this? There was a gay band like the YMCA Village People in Canada, the Bronsky Beat. I knew, okay, Bruce, you like your little ribs. Didn't know until years later, another Tarantino story, we go up to visit Mrs. and Mrs. Hart, Mr. and Mrs. Hart, Stu and Helen Hart, up at 90, 1991, Summer Slammer Survivor Series, and I went into Bruce, and he was there, laying on the couch, and I said to him, I says, you know, I figured it out, Bruce, because you used to be a school teacher. I says, I knew about the Bronski beat, but I didn't know until a couple of years later when I got into the acting that the character Brick. I liked the name Brick. It was a character name on Santa Barbara and the Paul Newman role in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Never heard the name before. I said, but the alliteration, alliteration worked. I says, but I found out a couple of years later, Bruce, knowing how you are, it wasn't just Bronski from the Bronski beat. You knew literature. I says, when you see the movie, Paul Newman's character is struggling with alcoholism, which had nothing to do with me. I says, but that was Hollywood that couldn't deal with the homophobia of it. If you read the Tennessee Williams play, the character Brick is a closet homosexual that's using alcohol to mask his real inner turmoil. He laid there and he had a smile. He loved that I figured it out. Or maybe he didn't. I don't know. Maybe he was the turmoil that I kept the name for the wrestling, but he gave me the damn name. Okay, so that's over with the Drumheller Dinosaur. And this is what set the tone. So he was nice to me that night. That's the last time. I don't know what happened. I don't know that it was the Drumheller Dinosaur, but here's what happened. This rib apparently came about from Jake the Snake Roberts, who was in the territory almost 10 years before I got there. And it apparently was his idea. Okay. You can have idea of a rusty well. That doesn't mean the well's any good. The point is, they had us drive up, and they said they did this to rookies. They go out of their way. I forget where it was. Lethbridge. It was Drumheller. There you go, the Drumheller dinosaur. Bruce. Now I'm, he's not driving. He's in the passenger seat, and I'm in the row behind on this 12-seat van for the good guys. The bad guys are in another van. But we go up to this thing, 
and he's building this up. Yeah, there's a monument up there for Stu. And I got to know Mr. Hart and Mrs. Hart at this point. So it wasn't that first time. It was after this. You go up there and St Bruce is building this up. Yeah, there's a monument up there. They've honored my father. It's a, you know, it's a life, it's a life-size statue of my dad. We get up to this thing, Drumheller. We get to the town square because there was a lot of dinosaurs found up there. There is a life-size, two, three-story high of a Tyrannosaurus Rex dinosaur. Building this up that this was a monument to his dad. If you met, ever met his dad, he kind of got older with his um, ostrich skin boots and the hair. Things get shorter. And, and I get there and there's like crickets from me. He turned around and he goes, oh, don't you think it's funny? And now I'm channeling my dad in me. I go, Bruce. And he goes, don't you think it's funny? I says, no. I go, that's your father. And a lull just came over. Did I wig out? No, it didn't cause the fight in the dressing room. It was, I was being sincere. It's like, how dare you? I wanted to say is, how dare you make fun of your father? Do you, don't you think it's funny? Well, it's funny? Don't you think it's funny? No. Bruce. Like I'm ch Now I'm chastising him. Bruce. That's my dad's face. Bruce, that's your father. Becky, who's calling me because she had the calling card, and she said, listen, I stalked Mr. Hart. You better be careful what you do on the road. They may have a blanket party with you where they take you out of the van, cover you in, and beat you up. I go, you, t the true story, I says, you, t you reassure Mr. Hart, and you let them know that if anything like that happens, there's going to be two to three of them with their throats ripped out, just like you see in the movie Roadhouse, but this is real. So you let them know I'm going to be okay. They're in the van, and they're doing these phony award toasts where somebody would say, oh, yeah, one will toast another. They'll bang the roof of the van, and then somebody will accept the award. They bang the roof of the thing. Well, I think it was Johnny Holiday in the back said, you know, we're giving him a hard time, but he, you know, he, he's, I saw him down there. He's as big as Lex Luger without two left feet. You really take a different thing to whatever. And now here... I remember Carl Moffat sitting next to me, looks at me. He goes, well, what do you say, Brick? And here again, couldn't just, I couldn't just take it. I said, well, all I have to say is I believe that Mr. Stewart would not appreciate you people banging the roof of his van. And there was a collective like, oh, what, how much more can he, now? what's he going to do? Now we're back in town. And I remember the two of them, the British Bulldogs. You can't, you can't touch Bruce. That's Helen's Bambi. That's where that whole, I knew his nickname, but you can't touch Bruce. That, that's Helen's Bambi. But you got to do something to Pillman. Got to do something to Pillman. Apparently there was heat there with them and whatever. I went into the dressing room. Dynamite got there late. The British Bulldog was there. By the way, that's the only time the Bulldogs came to the Calgary on a Friday night after they went to the New York office, whether they were in town or not, they never came to the TV tapings. They were only here for this thing. What ended up happening, and now we're spilling everything that, that, ha that from there. I came in, it's like, okay, I guess they're looking for a show. I told Bruce off, and he just kept avoiding me. Because he would walk away from me telling him everything you're doing, you have no respect for your father, I can't believe the way you treat him, blah, blah, blah. Carl Moffat, I says, these people treat you like idiots. You're the only one. I'm the only one that was your friend. Whether he wants to admit it or not, he cried. And I turned around, and there's Pillman. I never struck anybody first in my life. I, I, I wasn't going to punch somebody. that could, And I slapped him. He looked both ways. He didn't seem to do anything. I turned away. And he fucking clocked me. And I understand. I remember Davy Boy Smith standing right there. He goes, you know, Pillman had all his rings taken off. He liked his jewelry. He goes, but when you started arguing with Bruce, he put his rings back on. Just going with what I heard. And it hit me. It's like, whoa. Boom, 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 boom. And then he, sh he like, whatever it was with the hits. And he rushed me like a football thing. Well, I can say I never struck anybody to initiate a fight. 
it was the closest time I ever had to losing a fight. I never brought this up anymore because the guy passed away. And to jump ahead in the story, Tarantino it again. When he came back from Cincinnati after the torn tricep, we were like asshole buddies. Bruce was no longer in charge, and we would be at the mini march. Do you want anything? Now nah, walk in with you. It was okay. Everything was fine. Back to the story. He rushes me. If he didn't have a head of hair on him, I'd have never made it. All I knew how to do is just grab his hair, his head, and get his flailing arms away from me. He ran out of steam running me through these chairs in that dressing room there. Now everybody's piled in watching. And I'm on my ass on the floor with my legs spread. His legs are spread eagled. And I'm take I got the back of his head. Now the punching stopped because he can't reach my face. I head butted his head on the floor a couple times. Didn't do anything. Now at some point he reaches up. And that's where the whole story is. Somebody, I heard he took an eye out. No, he tried to this eye. It came down. I bit his, I hold his tongue in the mouth. I held his middle finger in my mouth. I reached down and I ripped his shorts off. Again, now he's, he's, done. he's not doing it. Still, he's a bull. If I stop now, he's just going to get up. Well, my legs were between his legs. And the truth of the matter is, I kicked him square in the balls. Didn't do anything. I kicked him again. And that the oomph went out of him. He, he slumbered back, stood up, I, ja I came up real quick, squared off, had his pants on, he goes, I've had enough of this shit. He leaves, there's Becky Wentz out there, and she's laughing, goes, you shouldn't be laughing, it was your boy didn't end up any better than I did. So call it whatever you want. I spoke to Becky just a week ago, she didn't know he died, and she goes, oh, he was a cocky jerk. I, I said, yeah, but he died. He goes, oh, I'm sorry I said that then. He goes, and at the end I joked, and she goes, but he was. But the point is, I says, we got along after that. She never knew that we got along after that. Back to old yellow journalist Uncle Davey Meltzer. He reports in his newsletter that, oh, Pillman beat up Bronski so bad that they couldn't show his match on television. Because he was Pillman's boy. You know, he loved Pillman. He loved, and of course, the authenticity of coming from the NFL and this, that, and the other, the dream boat and blah, blah, blah. And of course, Bruce sending all these disparaging things about me. Too stupid to realize you're making Kerry Brown look bad. Bottom line is the guy didn't have an editor, had no fact checker to anything that was going on, made the guy look stupid again for the third time, and I'm done. The pu Bruce's puppet, the Bruce the puppeteer, had Meltzer's Pinocchio here to lie for him. But uh, at that point, I remember it was Mike Mittman, and he ended up being in our movie, Mass Mutilator, and he was a local referee, but he was, when it was national TV tapings and such, yeah, national TV tapings, and he said to me, he goes, Jeff, you're worried about what they're going to do with you, and he looked over at like Dino Bravo and Hercules and so forth, he says, these wrestlers are wondering how long they're still going to be here. He says, if you can get into movies with Dale Schneck. He goes, I would pursue that. And it was at that same time that at the, with the six months, uh, well, six months into 89, so after eight months total there with Titan, I tore the short head, of, short head of the bicep off the bone. They said it'd be a 12 to 16 month recovery time. And I remember the good Mr. Schneck, uh, the producer, executive producer of Mass Mutilator, said, I'd like to teach you how to read a monologue. You're not going to get many movie parts on just your meeting the hand, shaking the hand, and them guy, the person liking you. And I went to New York. We auditioned for a part in Sergeant Kabuki Man NYPD. Got the role at the end of the second day on the set. Lloyd Kaufman wanted to give me the lead in the next movie, which is then we did Class of Newcomb High 2 and 3. I have to say, I always admired as a kid growing up professional wrestlers that got into acting. We're talking from Mike Mazurki on the Munsters, Judo Jean LaBelle, Count Billy Varga. Most people don't know that Nick Bockwinkle was a supporting actor on an early episode of Hawaii Five-O, and classy Freddie Blassie, I guess where they got the Hollywood fashion plate, he is on an episode of the Dick Van Dyke Show 
as Cla as Freddie Blassie, the champion, because they were based on the West Coast. So you can go on from there, from Terry Funk and Paradise Alley, went on to Roadhouse. Always wondered how, and hey, wrestling is truly could be an, e an in. Well, now the rest is history with The Rock and John Cena and all that. But that I admired, where they could work their way into things and so forth. So after doing these trauma films, it was Tom Taylor, who's in one of these pictures, and one of the stars of Mass Mutilator, approached me, mutual uh, compatriot with Mr. Dale Schneck, and he wanted me to put together for him a demo reel for his karate stuff, at which point he, he, he came to me and he said that, because um, I'd learned from the second unit director, Phil O'Dell, on the Newcomb High movies on how to shoot sights, fight sequences, the director wasn't even there, how to make sure that the shots are not missed and you know missing punches and so forth. Well, he came to me and he said, you know, I have this idea, you know the guy had a wonderful screenplay, Mass Mutilator, and he says, I believe if you can direct it, we can get Dale to propel this thing to the next level.